Well, Intramuros for me uh, is many things because uh, my father used to work in the port area, in Binifacio Drive in port area. So even as a small boy, uh, I really knew Intramuros already back in the 50s. And I was very happy to have been appointed administrator in 1989. And uh, that really uh, involved me more uh, with the history of Intramuros and the uh, plans uh, for its further development. It would be very uh, important that uh, we know where we came from and uh, I think that's the uh, special value of Intramuros. But even in modern times, uh, there could be or there should be, and uh, as it's happening now, uh, other developments here in Intramuros. I'm Jose Capistrano Jr., uh, formerly administrator of Intramuros. Well, uh, as what's happening now, uh, Escuela Talier assists in the restoration of heritage structures uh, through our training of uh, out-of-school youth in the various arts and crafts of uh, heritage uh, restoration. And uh, I think this is uh, important uh, to preserve our historical and heritage structures uh, and at the same time also reach out to other parts of the country uh, for the same purpose. If you're looking at um, Intramuros from the perspective of history, it's one place where you could actually see the history of the Philippines uh, as it unfolded. Um, I see that um, Intramuros is a, an area which can embody the concept of reuse in urban planning. So just think of old structures being utilized in a modern sense. I think the challenge for us in IA is how can we recreate the former ambiance so that people can relive history um, through Intramuros. And then that's where uh, it becomes a site where we can educate people on the version of history according to the Filipinos. So I am Roberto Alabaro III and uh, currently I'm the Assistant Secretary for Tourism Development Planning and it's fantastic to have an urban area, an old urban area, where in the um, maybe in our generation we can see this transformed into a, or a more developed society where poverty will no longer exist within the walls of Intramuros. Intramuros for me is, I would say, the soul of our country. My name is uh, Paolo Mercado. I'm the founder and president of the Creative Economy Council of the Philippines. Uh, this is an advocacy group that we set up about two years ago to promote the creative industries, uh, both in the uh, public and private sector. So, the concept of creative economy essentially is uh, taking a look at the contribution of the totality of creative industries and creative individuals to the national economy. So, and to uh, um, our thrust is to get the government to recognize it as a priority strategic sector and uh, support it with, let's say, um, uh, incentives or in, from the private sector investments that would make it grow faster. So I wish for Intramuros in the near future to become the country's most iconic creative hub. Ang 
ano ko po sa Intramuros sa isang ano, isang kasaysayang lugar. Kasi dito, dito nagkaroon ng ano, digmaan. Hindi nyo natutunan ko sa eskwelahan. Uh, sa akin sa nang laki po nang naitulong ng eskwela talaga kasi nung Nung ano, nung una po na hindi pa ako nakapasok dito, high school graduate lang ako, nahihirapan ako maghanap ng trabaho. So nung nakita ko na mag-opening sila na ano, kailangan nila na ng trainees, so pumasok ako yun. Tapos pagka-graduate ko, binigyan nila ako ng opportunity na magtrabaho sa mga heritage site. Uh, ako po si Christian Edward Aguirre. Bali, ano po, instructor po ako ngayon ng ano, Masonry Workshop dito sa Eskwela Talia. Ang laki ng ano, tulong, unang-una doon sa paninirahan. Uh, nagkaroon, mayroon kami matitiraan sa loob. Dito ako nakatira. Sana po mas tumibay pa ang komunidad dito sa loob. Tira ako sa Basco Street, Intramuros, Manila. Doon ako nagkaroon ng um, misip. Doon ako, dito ako nakita, ano, dito ako lumaki. Ginagawa ko dito sa Eskwela Talyero, sa trabaho ko. Isa ako sa mga heritage protector na uh, isa akong mason. Ito ako yung Eskwela Talyero na nagtitrain sila ng mga out of school dito. May kahit na high school graduate lang uh, pinasok ko. Tinitrain nila hanggang sa Mahasa as tinuha din nila as worker din. Ako si Edsel Paul Pauhay ah, tumutulong para maibalik yung ganda ng drum rules. Para mas maibaganda yung drum rules para sa lahat. Eskwela Talyer, ito yung nagbigay sa akin ng, ano, pangalawang, ng pangalawang pagkakataon na ayusin lahat. Tinutulungan kami para ma-develop yung mga skills namin para magkaroon kami ng kakayahan na gumawa ng sarili rin namin pagkakakitaan. Yung natapos ko dito ay carpentry and woodworks at painting and finishing. Uh, ako si Romel Rivera. Graduate ako ng Eskwela Talier ng Batch 7. Ma-improve siguro yung, yung pagkikipagkonekta ng mismong Intramuros Administration sa community. Yung mas mapal, ano pa, mas mapatibay pa. Pag, pa. Pagdadagdag pa sa mga pwedeng magamit na parte ng Intramuros. Yung trabaho ng mama ko kasi dito sa San Agustin Church. Parish coordinator siya, kaya ano pa lang yun, hindi pa ako pinapanganak, nandun na siya. Intramuros, ano na sa akin to, parang 
mahal ko yung lugar na yan kasi dito na ako nag dito ako pinanganak eh. Ito ay ayun yung pinakabahay ko, hindi lang yung bahay na tinutulugan ko sa loob. Yung mismo Intramuros, siya na yung pinakabahay ko, yung mismo pader. Safe ako pag nasa loob. For me, Intramuros is a place of history. Um, it is a cultural and creative hub, and um, it brings so much pride and joy to the 5th District as well. If I could describe Intramuros in one word, it's mesmerizing because Walking along or walking around, it gives you a sense of history and makes you step into a whole new world that is so different from what you see outside the walls of Intramuros. My fondest memories of Intramuros, I would say, was when I was a little girl because I also grew up here in the 5th district and as a little girl, I would come to Intramuros with my parents, I would tag along, I would ride the Kalesa, I would go around in Tremuros, Fort Santiago, and I would remember also coming to Barbaras to eat with my dad. Hi, my name is Crystal Bagat Singh. I am currently the Congresswoman of the 5th District of Manila, where Intramuros is located. One of my advocacies is um, about culture, preserving culture, and uh, one of the things that I also do as a congresswoman is make legislation and I also have a constituency inside Intramuros. I think it's very important because when you say Metro Manila, there is really no place to go to for a cultural experience or for a historical experience. And there's really no other place like Intramuros. It's, it's, a, it's an original. There's nothing like it. If you want to have a feel of how it was to live during the Spanish times, this is where you go. I wish that everybody would work together to keep Intramuros the way it is, but make it better, preserve it better. Intramuros is very important to us because of the lessons in heritage and history. Siguro in one line no, ng objective ng Bahay Chinoy, establish our rightful place in the Philippine sun. Nag, uh, bukas ito sa public noong 1999, no? uh, inilalarawan nito ang bahagi at ang impact ng mga Chinese Filipinos in all aspects of Philippine life. I wish that the Bahay Chinoy can be recognized in the whole Intramuros and the whole Philippine society. I wish all the visitors, the audience, regardless of race, regardless of origin, regardless of your religion, can be recognized as part of this nation and as part of this uh, nation building and the history of the Philippines. Ako po si Teresita Angsi, founding president ng Kaisa Para sa Kaunlaran at ngayon ay executive trustee ng Kaisa Heritage Foundation na nagmamanage sa Bahay Chinoy Museum of the Chinese in Philippine Life. For me, Intramuros is our past, present, and our future. And because of that, it is very important in our lives. We must be involved 
involved and engaged in Intramuros, and we as citizens must do everything to keep it alive, to keep it vibrant, because it is the archive of our history. It is the archive of who we are as a people. Well, I'm Olivia Limpeao. I'm the president and CEO of Distillery Limtuaco and the fifth generation master blender and distiller of the oldest distillery in the Philippines. So our company was established in 1852 and it was our founder is uh, Don Bonifacio Limtuaco who came from China, Fujian, China, and he introduced to the Philippines this product called Shok Hok Tong, which eventually became the generic term uh, for Chinese medicinal wine, Shok Tong. And so uh, we are very much part of the history of the Philippines through our liquor making with 167 years of history and legacy that we have shared with this country. is very important because this was really the seat of um, governmental power and uh, trade, culture, religion, and we're very proud to be part of Intramuros now through our museum. While our role in Intramuros is really to provide another tourist spot, you know, another tourist spot where through our museum, Tourists can learn more about our country, about our products, about our industry. And uh, we're very proud to be given that opportunity to participate, you know, in promoting culture through food. Well, I would really love that Intramuros would be teeming with tourists, with young people working in this place, celebrating our history, and our culture and sharing it with the rest of the world. Similar to what other countries are doing, for instance, like in Tallinn, Estonia, where they have a medieval, medieval walled city. I wish uh, our Intramuros would be not just like that, but maybe even better, you know? So it would be um, really a living walled city of the past, the present, and the future. Ang mga binibenta ko po pagkain na ulam, adobo, sinigang, kaldereta, pork chop, fried chicken, eh, may mga gulay, pakbe, tsaka chop soy. Nakaramihan ako makain sa akin, nagtatrabaho sa Mapua, mga empleyado. Tapos, estudyante rin ng Mapua, eh, si yung Manila High. Ayun po, nakakatulong ang tindahan po namin sa Intramuros, lalo na po ang sana may malaking bagay po sa mga estudyante at mga empleyado sa Intramuros na nagtatrabaho kasi uh, pangmasa po ang presyo. 40 years na po ako nakatira sa Intramuros, nararasa na namin yung hirap, baha. <laughs> Para sa amin, ang Intramuros, malaking bagay kasi dito nabuhay yung mga anak ko, dito ako nagpalaki ng mga anak ko, dito, dito ko kinuha yung pampalaki ng mga anak ko, maaral. Kaya ang Intramuros, malaking bagay sa amin. Dito na rin nag-aaral ng mga anak ko ng high school, elementary sa Quiapo, Mabini, sa guys ko sa Manila High School, sa Intramuros. Ako, ako po si Edna Apable. Meron isang karindirya sa Intramuros. Ang ginagawa ko po, namamalik sa madaling araw. May nagluluto, nagtitinda. Ang pangarap ko po sa Intramuros, sana huwag kami mawala at habang buhay kami makapaghanap buhay sa Intramuros.
So naging special sa akin yung Tremolos dahil uh, dito rin ako nakatira so dito na rin ako uh, kumuku uh, kumukuha para sa hanap buhay namin. And then ang Tremolos din para sa akin is parang isang tahanan na rin para sa akin. So ang role ko dito sa Intramuros ay parang uh, tayo naging nag-a-attract or nagpapa-attract sa mga turista dito sa loob ng Intramuros para kahit pa paano makita rin nila yung kagandahan ng Intramuros. Ako nga pala si Valentino Mejia, isang e-trike driver dito sa Intramuros. So ang nakikita ko sa future ng Intramuros is uh, lalawak pa yung Uh, ating turismo dito sa loob ng Intramuros and then talaga makikilala ang Intramuros sa buong Pilipinas, hindi lang sa buong Pilipinas sa buong mundo Ang Intramuros isa sa pinakamahalagang lugar dito sa buong Pilipinas ito ay isa sa pinaka-historical place. Ay naitutulong ng isang kutsero ay, ay may turo sa mga bawat na mga masyal kung anong mahalagang lugar dito sa Intramuros. Mga role ng mga kutsero ay kailangan uh, panatili, malinis ang lugar tapos sa uh, maglinopobi at sundin ang mga alituntunin ng Intramuros. Dito sa Intramuros, sana uh, sa araw o bawat sa linggo, bigyan nila ng uh, mga libre na mga lugar para lalong pasyalan ng mga mamamasyal dito sa Intramuros. Yung iba kasi uh, na mamamasyal dito, hindi nakakapasok sa mga lugar-lugar kasi may mga bayan. Ako po pala si Romeo M. Javier bilang isang kutsero at bilang isang tour guide sa Intramuros. Dito rin ako nabubuhay at nabubuhay ang aming pamilya. Kaya malaking, malaking tulong ang Intramuros sa buhay ng bawat isang kutsero din. Dahil po sa isang hanap buhay na marangal, na nagpipidikap. Dati po akong waiter ng Tamay Skatering. Ngayon, nagpipidikap na po ako dahil marami pong turista dito sa loob ng Intramuros. Nandito po ako sa Intramuros, 1994. Bukod po sa pagpipidikap, tinitrain po kami ng DOT sa pag-guide ng tour and guide sa Intramuros. Sa darating na panahon, marami pa pong mga improvement ang Intramuros dahil sa IA, sa maintenance, sa kalinisan, kayusan. Ah, good morning po. Ako po si Gerald Abillar. Ang trabaho po dito ay nagpipidikab. Ah, ang gusto pang nangyari dito sa loob ng Intramuros ay ma-improve yung kagandahan, maraming matulungan na barangay.
<clears throat> Hello everyone, uh, this is Ranchar Celia and welcome to the 25th episode of the Intramuros Learning Session. Our topic to for architecture of Intramuros and we are happy as our speaker, an expert on architecture theory. Now, before we start, I'd like to show first some house rules. If you are on Zoom and you would like to ask questions, you may send it to the Q&A button, which is found in the lower portion of the screen. If you are viewing via Facebook, you may send in your questions in the comment section. Only those who have successfully registered and viewed on Zoom will be eligible to get a certificate. A feedback form will be emailed to you after the session, and a certificate will be sent within a week. Note that this uh, webinar is recorded. Ensure that your audio is okay wear your reliable set of headphones, and most importantly, get yourself comfortable and enjoy. Now, I'd like to call on the Administrator of Intramuros, Attorney Guilherme Acido, who will introduce for us today our speaker. Attorney? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to have you all again this uh, weekend regarding the, um, the topic on Intramuros' uh, learn, uh, built heritage. Um, Intramuros is known to have many layers in its heritage, and one of it is its uh, architectural and built heritage. So we are fortunate for this afternoon to have uh, Professor Karin Santillan. Um, Professor Santillan is a Tomasian. She holds a BA in architecture from the University of Santo Tomas. And um, she also holds a postgraduate degrees and MA and PhD from the Graduate School of Engineering in the, at the University of Tokyo. She is presently consultant in the University of Santo Tomas Center for Conservation of Cultural Property in the Tropics. And she has worked as well on projects with the National Commission on Cultural and Arts and involved in a number of conservation management plan studies as well, particularly in the Tramuros, Basilica Minor de San Sebastian, and the Manila Central Post Office Building. Um, Professor Santillan currently teaches at the College of Architecture of the University of Santo Tomas. And her main research interests are on the, uh, modern Asian architecture, architectural morphology, and uh, phenomenology. So, good afternoon, everyone, and I hope you will uh, continue to enjoy with us this afternoon uh, with the uh, learning sessions on built heritage of the Tramuros. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. And I'd like to call on now our lovely speaker for today, Architect Santillan. Thank you, Ron. So, and thank you very much for the kind introduction, Attorney Asido. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the Intramuros Administration for inviting me to be part of its Intramuros Learning Session. I know these series of lectures have been very popular lately, and I hope I don't spoil your winning streak. Anyway, um, I'm going to share my screen. All right. So before I begin, um, I would like to start with a disclaimer. I'd like to apologize in advance in case my children, my cats, or my dogs decide to um, barge in on this talk. If they do, just please ignore them. Um, I've tried doing that, it doesn't work, but yeah, it's all I can do really, so um, you bear with me. Anyway, so good afternoon again, my name is Karen, and the title of my talk today is Looking at Layers, a Reassessment of the Built Heritage of Intramuros. So the first part of my talk will deal with a brief historical analysis, then I'll discuss the layers of use, layers of built heritage, and then significance. After that, I'll give a brief summary, and then I'll wrap up. So the historical analysis, um, what I'm going to show you today, is actually um, the product of several months of hard work of our team, which contributed to the conservation management plan of Intramuros last year. So at this point, I want to acknowledge the hard work of our research team, headed by architect Michael Manalo. Um, Architect, uh, which included myself, architect Ron J. Mabuga, architect Sayer Celia from MNL Solutions, um, and also including Tina Kwan and Rona Lepangkol of USTCCC. So, again, this is a super condensed 
version, um, several months of work. Uh, before I begin, and there goes my dog, I'm sorry. So before I begin, I'd like to briefly um, outline the sources of our data. So we looked at archival documents, not only from the Philippines, but also from Spain and the U.S. We also reviewed secondary documents as well as legislation pertaining to Intramuros. Lastly, we also looked at all the documents that Intramuros administration had to offer. So all the maps, all the plans, all the statistics that they had on hand, they kindly turned it over to us for review for the conservation management plan. Sometimes there's um, a problem when we do historical and archival analysis because uh, sometimes there isn't much data to be had. But in the case of Intramuros, it was completely the opposite. There was a surplus of data. In fact, there was so much data that at the beginning, we were actually um, in a quandary. How would we analyze everything? Because there was, there was so much to analyze. There were so many studies that had already been done. And of course, those should be um, put into context also. So basically, what we did, we um, uh, please don't get me wrong, that whole thing, it was a very happy problem to have. We're happy to have a lot of sources because this just means that um, our, the, the fruits of our research will be all the more um, significant. All right, so what we did, we looked chronologically at uh, all the data. We arranged it chronologically, I mean, and we listed, we were careful to list down the sources for each one. So we were, um, we worked somehow with a table like this in order to arrange all the data. And for this, we were able to distinguish seven key periods that define how Intramuros as a settlement and as a city was formed. So these are the seven key periods, which I will be discussing in detail in a few. So we further identified certain parameters to properly analyze and compare each of these um, different periods. So first, we had uh, what we call what we call the four the four pillars, which are government, religion, population, and economic activity. So these four pillars were present at the founding of the walled city, and they are still present today. Um, but one question we were interested in answering was, how did these pillars, how did these uses change over time? Because of course, we cannot expect them to be the same all throughout the life of Inframuro. In addition, we also extracted the use, the physical or built environment, and the significance of each period. So these are, um, this is also the seven key periods. All right, so the first period features pre-colonial Manila, or Manila as pre-colonial settlement, wherein um, communities grew organically in a river race or a linear pattern. Um, which followed the coastline. This pattern is very, very um, common in, in, in insular Southeast Asia, and it allows communities to connect with each other. So when Juan de Salcedo and Martin de Goiti arrived in 1570, this is what they saw. They already saw a strategically located thriving settlement that was ruled by Raja Suleiman, and this is the Supra Barangay that we now know as Okay. So the settlement was the largest in the Philippines at that time, and it was already engaged in insular as well as international trading activities in the Southeast region, as well as China. So using the four pillars, we know that Manila already had a large population, and it already had a political system in place. As I said, it was a supra barangay, and Raja Suleiman presided over some 2,000 people. So the religion was Islamic, and it was very strategic um, location for trading. So in the second period, Manila has evolved into the primate Spanish colonial city in the Far East. So we can see that Spain was successful in transporting Manila into Manila, which was home to all key political, religious, and educational institution. So this is where the cathedral housing the Diocese of Manila was located, and it also housed um, the five monastic complexes of the pioneering religious orders, the residence of the Governor General, as well as the first schools and colleges in the archipelago. 
So being the capital, the Spanish government gave considerable attention and funding toward the improvement of Manila. This included the walls, the streets, the, the fortification, and the structures within. Um, fortifications of Manila were strengthened starting in 1574 and uh, replaced by stone beginning in 1591 to 1594. It assumed most of its present shape by 1781-1787 and constant improvements and adaptation in Manila's architecture and fortifications were made in response to several attacks and natural disasters that destroyed parts of the city. So, some of the things that affected the growth of Manila, of course, where um, the slide I'm showing you right now, which features fires, earthquakes, and attacks. So, um, you can see the attack of Yumahong in 1574, of the Chinese revolt and the Dutch invasion in 1646. Um, we see government morphing into something more defensive. So they, from the government, it becomes military. So it's poised for defense. So the Muros uh, developed in the fortress that we know it that we know it today, and it became home to a very very diverse population. And since it was the easternmost terminus of the Trans-Pacific Galleon trade, it became a very, very wealthy settlement. But things, as I said, things also happened during the second period. There were earthquakes, there were fires, there were revolts, and there were attacks. And the fortress of Intramuros became the symbol of Manila. And this is something that I like to tell my students, actually. Um, there's this scene in the cartoon Mulan that... Um, that uh, the bad guy, I forget his name now, he actually said um, the emperor of China invited him in by building the wall. So it's, it's, it's something like that. Sorry, uh, you're obviously yeah. speaking out the wall. Can you please the mic? Okay, my audio is not yeah. All right. All righty, all righty. Okay, so let me see. Could I exit for a minute and check my audio? Is that okay? <laughs> All right, give me a minute, sorry, just to check if it is the one. Okay, sorry about that. Is that better now? Thank uh -huh. you. Thanks for telling me that, so appreciate it. All right. Where was I? I'm sorry. Okay, so um, Manila became, Intramuros became a symbol of conquering Manila. So instead of being like a safe haven for people, the people who lived in Intramuros um, were put in a very precarious position because they became a target. So people began to move out toward the Arabales. So Intramuros uh, still remained the seat of power, but the population was in decline. So the Catholic order still occupied the walled city and with the rise of the affluent class, the schools and institutions for learning prospered. So these maps show Intramuros and the Arabales. So you can see that the, the, uh, the areas outside Intramuros are already beginning to be populated. All right, so the, the third period shows, as I said, the rise of the Arabales. I'm sorry, my slides seem to be in this array. But anyway, this explains the exodus from Intramuros to Extramuros because of all the invasions, all the epidemics, and all the calamities that happened. And it also signaled um, the end of the galleon trade in Manila, and the Chinese also transferred from Binondo to Parian. So we see that there is also a movement from the, the government, so it becomes as I said, it became military and the people became vulnerable, but the religious order still stayed within the precinct of Manila. Okay, so this is the map um, by Herrera showing Manila and the Arabales, and another uh, print by uh, Lozano showing, um, of course, Manila Cathedral and Plaza Roma and the, the port of Manila. All right, sorry, we're back on track. Okay, the fourth period. The transfer of the governor general's residence from Intramuros to Malacanang. So this is 
kind of like the institutionalization of intramural. Um, of course, when the governor general moved his residence, the rest of the people who were living in Intramuros, who were still hanging on to Intramuros as their place of residence, also began to move out. Because, of course, the most powerful person in, in the island was not living there anymore. So it began to lose its luster or its appeal as a place of residence. But uh, what we mean was in Intramuros are the government offices, the military institutions, educational and religious institutions. So it, it was also during this time that the student population of Intramuros actually increased. So another earthquake managed to spur the remaining residents out of Intramuros. So the military and the government, as well as religion and education, remained strong. However, the population was at an all-time low and economic activity also was at an all-time low. So the fifth period is the period of redefinition, and it starts with the arrival of the Americans. So the city planner, Daniel Burnham, as we know, came to Manila, and he redefined the city of Manila. And he is partially the reason why Intramuros is still here, because he saw value in it being um, a symbol of our Spanish colonial past. So during this time, the government functions as well as some orig um, original institutions moved out. So USD moved out, Ateneo moved out, and the walled city in Tremoros, it actually um, took on the character of a relic, something like uh, something that you would view in a museum, something that was in the past, whereas the rest of Manila was progressing into something else, into the modern ages. But it was still a symbol of the past. So it was also during this time that the name Intramuros was actually given to the area because before it was actually called Manila. But now that Manila spread out, it was given the name of Intramuros. So if you look at the four pillars, all that remains in Intramuros during that time is religion. So at the seat of the Diocese, diocese of Manila, it did its move. And during this time, the area was mostly associated with um, religious activities and festivals. So here we see a picture of Santiago with the flag of the U.S. being flown. So the sixth period um, starts directly after World War II. And uh, Intramuros, as we know, was severely damaged by the war. And after the war, it was actually called a no man's land because um, probably only the, the Church of San Agustin and most of the walls and commenced the Miawe, I'm sorry, and most of the walls were, in, were still in place. Okay, he wants, he kind of wants to join the audience. I'm so sorry about that. Okay, so um, Fort Santiago was declared a national shrine. And Intramuros was declared, the whole of Intramuros was declared a national monument um, since 1951. And after that, the efforts to conserve the walled city began. I don't know what I'll do to make him leave me, but he's so attached. So this next photograph shows us just how devastated Intramuros was after the Second World War. So you can see that nothing, nothing really was left. So shells of buildings are all that we can see. And one of the only structures that has a roof is, as we see now, it's um, uh, San Agustin. So this is how bad Intramuros was after the war. That's why everything that we see in Intramuros now was mostly rebuilt after the war. So it was also during this time that informal settlers from the province started to come in and started to settle in Intramuros. So here are photos of some of the informal settlers um, amid the, the, uh, all the buildings in Intramuros. So if we look at our four pillars, population is on the right, albeit in the form of informal settlers. Religion stays very strong and, of course, um, other institutions of learning come in and make their home in Intramuros. And because new commercial buildings were erected, this brought um, 
new economy to the district because of, this, of, of all the uh, educational institutions. Um, of course, this this spurred a new economy for, for the district. So finally, we come to the last period, which begins after the Istanbul administration was established. So the district was then properly recognized for its cultural and historical significance. So the walls and the grid pattern were, ma were maintained, but um, new uses were introduced. And the thrust of, of the whole district became geared toward tourism. So as you can see, there was an active move to repopulate the area with government offices. Although some um, townhouses and condominiums opened up, most of the population still consisted of these informal sectors. So the Church of San Agustin, one of the only surviving buildings after the war, was recognized as a World Heritage Site alongside um, the churches of Hawaii, Yagao, and Santa Maria under the title Baroque Churches of the Philippines. So the area also retained its character as a center for learning, as schools, universities, and other vocational training institutions flourished in the area. So now that we're done, we're actually done with, uh, with years and years of historical analysis, um, we now proceed to the next part of the presentation, which deals with um, the layer of use. Okay. So the next series of slides are actually, um, and I told Rachel this a while ago, they're actually leftovers from um, the studies we did for our CMP last year. So these are, I'm so sorry, but these are tira -tira, but these are good studies. So I decided to show them to you today. They weren't exactly included in our submission um, of the CMP when we submitted to IAA. But still, I think um, they might be of some use. I'm showing presenting them to you now um, in the hope that they might fuel further study and it might assist the conservation and growth of the walled city of Intramuro. So now one of the questions that our group was uh, discussing when we were doing the research for, for the CFP is what kind of architecture does the walled city have? So most of us in the group were architects and we were um, involved in built heritage conservation and it was actually our first time to deal with um, a conservation management plan of a whole district instead of one building. So we were saying, um, what's the architectural character? How do we find out the architectural character of Intramuro? And um, we tried to look at the studies that had been done previously in order to answer this question. So a lot of the studies that are available in Intramuro right now deal more with um, urban morphology, um, like the series of maps that was prepared by the Planning Resources and Operations System in 1994 for the Development Plan. So we see um, stages of the development in Intramuros, um, from when it didn't have the walls to having the walls to having the mode and having the mode filled in. So this next um, slide shows a very good study done by Dr. Shioda and his colleagues over at the University of Shiga Prefecture in Japan. Um, this study adds three more layers to the one I previously showed you. So it shows um, the original Maitilad of Raha Suleiman, which is now um, where Fort Santiago is, and it shows the diagonal that Burnham wanted to um, incorporate into the plan that this was never carried out, and it also shows um, uh, how Istanbul looks like now. Okay. But um, these are actually very good studies, um, but they don't show us the kind of architecture. They're, they're more on patterns, street patterns, urban patterns, but they don't show us, um, they don't answer um, anything about architecture. So we thought maybe one way to analyze architecture is to look at the actual use of the building inside the Kaburos. So a little bit of trivia. Okay. Um, we actually listed down the use for all the maps, all the archival maps um, we got that had, that had labels. 
So we try to list them down to, to try and see how the use of the walls will be changed over the years. And um, this was also because we were trying to find connections with the old use and the current use, trying to find validation in that. So among the things that intrigued us was the occasional improvement of a bin or a bakery. So you would be reading um, the description. Usually it, it would be on top. And it would say um, things like cornel, independencia, audencia, iglesia, y convento, that suddenly, panaderia. And we were like, wow, oh, why is this bakery so important to Istamuros that it merited an actual inclusion in the map? Because, of course, all the other institutions that were listed were, you know, um, part of the fortification, baluartes, um, government buildings. Not even residences, but more government buildings and institutions. And then suddenly they put in a panaderia. And we were we were wondering why. And uh, for the people on the team, because I, I was doing a bit of research lately, and I came across um, this article. Uh, it's called The Butcher's Baker and the Carpenter, Chinese um, in the Spanish Philippines. So this is an article by Lucille Chia of the University of uh, California. Okay. And this it says here that there's a section that in 1686, some Chinese broke into the quarters of the constable who was in charge of residence permits because the Chinese, of course, needed to have residence permits to stay in Manila. So they, they entered the quarters of the constable, they, they killed him and another Spaniard. Another and there were rumors going around that the Chinese makers, um, presumably of that panaderia, were actually in on the whole plot, okay? So um, they were actually implicated in the whole plot. They said they were part of the planning of, of the whole thing. But, um, and this is funny, and I highlighted the section in red here. I, I don't know if you can read it, but it says here that the judge eventually threw out the case, okay? Um, because, of course, it says here that um, there was not enough evidence to convict the Chinese makers. But also, if you read between the lines, you will see that um, they were also, the case was also thrown out partially because um, the Chinese makers had to go back to work because the Spanish makers who had taken their place were producing inedible bread. <laughs> so they had, the Chinese uh, bakers had to come back and resume their work and to, to make bread for the whole of Isamuro. And which basically means that um, the origins of Spanish bread will forever be, remain a mystery. Okay, so thank you. After that commercial break, we return to the assessment of the current use of Itramuro. So we turn to more recent studies for this. So among these are the Itramuro Development Plan by Ross, which was done in 1994. Also, um, the case study of Manila by Dr. Cristina Toralba, which was included in this ABB study of a revitalization of historic inner city areas in Asia. And lastly, we also looked at assessment and recommendations for improving civil mobility within Intramuros, which was commissioned by the World Bank in 2014. So all of these included land use plans. This is the one by Gross in 1994. This is the one by Dr. Toralba and her students from Mahua. In 2007. And this is the one included in the World Bank study. Sorry, I kind of tilted it um, because all the other maps were lying down. So this was um, commissioned by the World Bank, as I said, in 2014. Now, having all this data is very important to the continuing study of the Wall City. And I personally think that um, this should be updated periodically. So there could be a comparison of how the city changes. And with that data, we could probably um, predict how it changes or anticipate the changes and probably um, come up with safeguards to cope with that. Okay. So, um, but we had to impose, in order to um, comparatively analyze this data, we had to come up with certain parameters like changing the colors, the, of um, each use designated here is because, of course, that is the prerogative of the people doing the survey to, to put their own colors, 
but um, in in order for us to look at them in um, in a uniform manner, we decided to assign our own colors to them. Okay. So, but also we were exhausting the possibilities with our four pillars. We were interested in the uses that specifically dealt with um, government, population, religion, and the economy. So here is a uh, simple diagram that we did um, based on the archival maps that uh, we were looking at, the buildings. So we listed down all the buildings that fell under government, fell under religion, economic activity. So the, you can see the Panaderia is strongly in the economic activity quarter, and of course, residences for the population. And this is the present day um, listing. So we got most of these buildings from um, the Intramuros administration rich property in density. Okay, so we would just like to show, share with you um, some of the analysis that we did. This, these are the maps that didn't make um, the submission to Intramuros administration. Um, so this is the composition of residential buildings in 1994, in 2007, and this is also in 2007, but this shows the composition of illegal settlers. And this one is from 2014. So we will see that although the locations of the residences vary, um, they're mostly poros. No, they're mostly poros, meaning that um, there's no one area designated for residences. So they're interspersed within the fabric, the building fabric of Intramuros. Um, probably because, yeah, the illegal settlers could take whatever vacant lot they could find to settle in. So the next series um, shows us the institutional composition of buildings in Intramuros. So included here are schools and universities, as well as government offices. So this is from 1994, this is from 2007, and this is from 2014. Um, although you can see there's a visual decrease in the number of institutions, um, most of them are still constant. So like Plaza Roma, the Manila Cathedral, um, Letran is still there, San Agustin, etc. And a lot of them are near um, the walls for the fortifications themselves. So next we're looking at economic activity or commercial. So this is from 1994. This is from 2007. And this one is from 2014. However, in the map of 2014, there was, um, there was a special category for um, buildings that catered solely to tourism purposes and buildings that catered to, that were actually warehouses. And um, Intramuros has a surprising number of warehouses. Okay. And that truck is probably headed toward the warehouse. Anyway, so this next um, series um, shows us mixed use. So this, um, so included here are residential, industrial, commercial, um, Building. So this is the one from 1994, and this is the one from 2007. Unfortunately, there is no such data from 2014. But I'm sure there are a lot of these buildings um, in and around uh, Intramuros as of present. So um, these studies, as well as these I'm showing right now, which are from um, the World Bank study, um, which are studies on transportation and mobility make for very, very interesting reading. And this will be of interest to urban planners who will probably make better sense of all of this data that I could ever I could ever have, so given the unlimited amount of time that we looked at this last year. However, even with um, the survey of this done, we still could not properly define the architectural character of Intramuros. Um, thus, uh, a visual survey of the distant buildings in Intramuros was carried out by architects Ronald Allen Mabunga and architect Theo John Residilia of MNL Solutions. So the next few slides I will be presenting is, um, are actually from their analysis of prevailing architectural styles in Intramuros. So this shows the oldest layer of styles with Spanish and American colonial buildings, as well as the ruins of colonial buildings. So of course we have um, San Agustin, here and for Santiago, 
um, sa intindihan siya among others. The next slide shows the composition of buildings that were built after the war. Um, but this was before the presidential decree um, 1616 was put into place. As we know, pre-1616 created the Antramuros administration for the purpose of restoring and administering the development of Intramuros. So these buildings mostly continued um, the, the tradition of American colonial or Western uh, colonial architecture, which they had been doing after the war. So um, we have, of course, the Manila Cathedral, which was rebuilt by Fernando Pampo Sr., the Knights of Columbus Manila Chapter Building, and the Colegio Santa Rosa. So the next slide shows us buildings that were also built after the war, but after PD-1616 was put into place. So we see a revival of mostly Spanish colonial styles, as is stated in um, the guidelines of PD-1616. So we have some buildings from Plaza San Luis and some commercial residential buildings um, pictured here. The next slide shows us a rather large composition of buildings, which were built in the modern style before PD-1616. But these aren't buildings that chose to conform um, to the stated architectural guidelines. So we can see that these buildings are larger, the blocks of the buildings are larger than the previous ones, and the scale and proportion, of course, are also, um, also deviated from, from previous styles because, of course, they occupy smaller lots. So this next slide shows us the composition of buildings constructed after the war, but whose composition and elements have remained decidedly modern. So most of them have incorporated elements such as uh, sunshades, and the forms and compositions are much like that of the modern movement or incorporating international styles. So I'll be showing you some examples of that. So the Gosaling Arsenio Lapsuan of the Pamantasan of Sud de Maynila. We have the Santa Rita Chapel um, inside the campus of Mabua University. We also have um, the Juan Mapua Memorial Hall. So the massing is very modern, but you can see at the bottom, um, the arches are still trying somehow to conform with um, the Spanish colonial edict of the area. And of course, you have the National Press Club by Angel Lapil, still standing, and I think um, it's gaining popularity as a place um, well, before before the lockdown and everything, as um, a place for music and spoken word or, or poetry or something. And of course, we have the Bureau of Immigration, and you can see um, all the sun shades, the sun shades I was talking about, um, adorning the front of the building. There's also very nice um, the Manila Fire Station. This is along Soriano Avenue, uh, leading to Atma Circle. And this is fire station. But if you look at if you look at it, the sun shades and of course the materials are very modern. But the massing of it, with, even with the overhang here, it sort of echoes the old Spanish colonial um, houses in the area. Okay. So with the, with with this overhang and having um, uh, the upper portion kind of floating. And of course, this very very nice uh, building which houses the Bank of the Philippine Islands. Okay. And also included in their visual survey was this autochthonous construction. Of course, these are the buildings of the illegal settlers. These are not permanent structures, usually garages and sheds um, made of light materials. Okay. Also the warehouse facilities, probably. So here it is. Um, variety of it and of course this visual survey um, was was done um, using Google Street View and it's uh, it's it's uh, there are still a lot of pockets here that need to be filled that need to be defined so I think further studies can contribute to this so the last layer we're going to look at is the significance so um, what is significance? I just want to briefly define what significance is. So there are many types of significance. There's aesthetic, historical, architectural, cultural, social, technical. 
logical, etc. And one structure can have multiple layers of significance, one on top of the other. But this needs to be studied so you know the hierarchy or the level of your significance, which is the most important, which is the least important. Um, significance varies from one structure to another. So in all the conservation management plans that we have done, always um, the significance varies depending on the type of building, on the particular history and the society of the building that, that occupies it. So in the case of Intramuros, um, the statement of significance is Intramuros as a resilient statement because it's still in the same place after all of these years. The grid remains the same and the uses are still almost the same. Um, and it's still, it's still alive. It's still a very vibrant um, settlement. So it's a very resilient it's, um, a model of a very resilient settlement. And this resiliency is manifested in both intangible and tangible aspects. So the intangible aspects include um, the four pillars, the uses, the, the government, population, religion, and economic activity, and how these uses are still existing in Intramuros. And for the tangible, of course, you would have the walls, you would have the grid, um, and of course, the remaining built heritage um, whose integrity and authenticity remain intact, such as the Church of San Agustin, and also to a lesser extent the buildings which have been rebuilt after the war, but uh, they were rebuilt in the same location and retained the same use as, uh, uh, as previous, as was before the war. Okay, so for example, Aletran is still in the same place, and the Manila Cathedral is still in the same place, and they both had the same use as before the war. So Intermonos and its, and its walls um, also serve as, okay, sorry, my slides are kind of mixed up, sorry. Um, it also serves as the buffer zone of the Church of San Agustin, so these are the core buffer maps for the Church of San Agustin, which, was, which were submitted to UNESCO. I think this was done in 2011. So this adds another layer of protection to the walled city. And I have to go back to that slide. And another addition um, to this is an unseen layer, which is the archaeological layer that lies beneath the whole of Intramuros. So this is something that we have to consider, especially when we do excavation of any sort. Okay, so another study about Intramuros that... Um, our team got very excited about was uh, this study, the Registry of Intramuros Cultural and Historical Properties, or the Rich Property Inventory, which details and classifies all the built heritage contained in Intramuros, even the walls. So you can see here, this is a sample page, so you can see um, the buildings listed down, and um, any pertinent information is listed, and the classification is also there. So, so it lists, of course, the walls and fortifications as significant. Also, of significance are the parks, the, uh, the plazas, the gardens, and the open spaces, often uh, containing monuments that are also important. And also, they listed structures and sites that were more than 50 years in existence. This is due to um, CD 166 or the Heritage Law, which uh, presumes that buildings 50 years old and above are of importance. Okay, so now that um, we have done all that, we have now come to our summary. So um, I'm going to start off with the rich inventory because we were really excited about this. We were so happy to see something like this um, from Intramuro. This is a document done by it. I think by Rancho, by, by IA, so produced by um, uh, IA itself. So um, I'm an educator, and as such, I'm going to give the IA homework. No, I'm kidding. Um, I think rich is a very good start, but it could be further enhanced. There's, there could be so much more to it. First, it might be good to visually represent all of these data um, onto the actual lot where they are located. Um, because uh, in, in the maps that are included in the rich inventory, it only indicates the blocks on which um, the buildings of high significance are located. And um, it would be nice to see it done per lot. I, we actually tried to do this, but we gave 
up after page five because it was so hot, hard to find um, the listing because each building was listed down with the block number, the lot number, um, and the significance. So it was, it was. Uh, we were trying to find uh, using the cadastral. We were trying to look at everything, and yeah, it was kind of. Uh, yeah, a very hard thing to do, and I, I realized that this is a very hard thing to do. But if, if you do that, it would be easy to see where the cultural properties are concentrated, and maybe perhaps efforts um, could be done to segregate certain areas or to, to come up with a, a specialized policies for certain areas. Okay. Um, also, we saw that the walls were already identified, but it would also be nice to include the grid. The grid is very important because it is what ties us um, to the laws of the Indies. It's, it's a visible representation of that, the laws of the Indies, the grid pattern, and how it's laid out. And uh, the walls themselves also deserve to be studied because they are really ties to um, Spanish colonial fortified cities. Of, things, um, of which I think there are only, uh, a number of in the whole world. And we are part of that heritage by virtue of having the and the grid with the wall. Okay, so the grid is important. And um, also um, including other, uh, maybe transforming the rich inventory into something that is quantitative. And I know, I guess, again, I know so show me this is um, not an easy task, but I think that this is already a very, very good foundation on which to start further study. So maybe um, don't worry, I'm also giving myself homework. So also for further studies, um, I also listed down. Um, there was much more that we wanted to do, but it wasn't included in our scope of work for the conservation management plan. Um, last year. So we also wanted to, in the future, I'd also like to see more visual studies on the architectural styles of Intramuro, something more comprehensive and um, something that emphasizes that, that has some analysis involved, especially um, looking at the object form and spatial form of all the buildings included herein. And I'd also like to see studies on modern architecture inside Intramuros because there are modern buildings inside Intramuros that coexist peacefully with the other buildings that conform to BD 1616. And they have their own um, very unique and very special architectural character that also, I think, should be preserved. So lastly, I'd also like to see um, studies on form and mapping of existing buildings. Um, this could be used to analyze probably um, uh, proposals for new buildings in Intramuros just to see how it fits in. Because, yes, the style is there, but very important also is mapping because you don't want to destroy um, the composition and the rhythm of Intramuros as a heritage district. Okay, so that's it for today. So thank you very much for listening, and I hope you enjoy that. Thank you. Thank you, Architect uh, Santillan, for that very uh, enlightening presentation. <coughs> and thank you as well for your comment on the registry of Intramuros. It was yes, I was very impressed with it. I wanted to tweak, I wanted to play around with it a bit. I said, okay, that's not in our scope, that's not our scope. We had to visibly, we, we wanted to do so much more with it. And yeah, it, it's a very nice study. Congratulations on that. Thank you so much. Uh, now we're going to open the Q&A portion okay, of Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so reminders for everyone. If you are on, in Zoom, um, no need to raise your hand uh, because there's a raise hand button here. Don't do that. Just directly key in your question in the Q&A button below the screen. Okay, for Zoom participants, there's a Q&A button below the screen. Just go there to ask your questions. For those who are viewing via uh, Facebook, you can just write your questions in the comment section and then our IA team will be silently working in the background, retrieving your questions and then transmitting them to me and then I will air them on uh, this uh, webinar. I will air them. I will read them aloud. Okay, so our first question 
is from Zoom. Uh, this one is from, uh, he did not say it, this is from an anonymous attendee. Is it, uh, there are some movements that advocate the reconstruction of Intramuros to its pre-war state. Uh, if yes, uh, if, is, if it is feasible, if yes, to what extent can Intramuros be reconstructed? What are your comments on this? Oh, that's a very touchy subject, no? The reconstruction. Um, our problem with this is that we couldn't find um, enough documentation on all the buildings. We have documentation of Intramuros, but not documentation of the buildings. And in order for you to be able to come up with a very good you have to have good documentation of law. Sadly, we don't have that. Your so, audio uh, is I think my internet is breaking up. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want me to repeat that answer, Sancho? Mm -hmm. if, if it's okay. Okay. Hold on. Let me just my audio again. All right. So my out. But yes, it's still this. Okay. So, um, my my ask that we uh, look at there are um, uh, people who espouse the reconstruction of Intramuros and they were saying like what about Warsaw? Okay, Warsaw was reconstructed after World War Two and it was one of the most devastated cities and Manila I think was only second to Warsaw, right? But the thing is, Warsaw actually prepared for that. They actually have they actually um, documented all the things, so they had plans, they had drawings of all the buildings. And what we have currently for Intramuros are just maps. And maps are not enough to reconstruct buildings. It's okay, you're proving that the city is the same, but yeah, it's not enough to uh, validate the reconstruction of a building. And for you to be able to do a very good reconstruction, you need documentation for that. And sadly, we don't have that. That's my ask for uh, the question on reconstruction. And I think in Warsaw, it was reconstructed immediately, no? Immediately. It and was. They actually had fun. They actually, they actually would go in there to the ground. So they, they, they put aside funds for it. And afterwards, they started building. So now, building because yeah, the, the, yeah. the people put value on these buildings. My audio is bad again. Okay. Yeah, I think yeah, I'm no. I wonder if that's better. Hello? That's better. What are you doing? <laughs> that's better. <laughs> okay, all right. So maybe it was my microphone. Yeah, better. Uh, I should have all tested right. the, right. that I know, the, the, the options I had. Sorry about that. Yeah. Audio all this time was so bad. Okay, I don't know to be, ha to be happy or sad about that. <laughs> all right, anyway. Where, 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 where were we? Yeah, Warsaw. Yeah, Warsaw was reconstructed immediately after the war, no? And there were a lot of remnants after the war. That's true. And as I said, a lot of, they were already preparing very well for this. They, they put aside plans. They documented the buildings. They put aside funds. They had funds for the reconstruction. We didn't have funds. <laughs> We didn't have money, so yeah, sadly, as time goes by, it's harder to document something when new buildings are already in place. So yeah, we don't have documentation, therefore, we cannot in all good conscience reconstruct faithfully if we don't have the basis for reconstruction. And if you're going to look at old photos of um, Intramuros after the war, you can see that after the war, there were a lot of ruins, but sometime in the 60s, suddenly Intramuros was a one big open space. So what happened to the building? So did 
did it just all suddenly disappear? Because there were ruins. The houses were still there. The churches mm -hmm. were still there. But somehow, during the 60s, everything was suddenly cleared. So what happened? We were thinking about that. We, we saw that. I was like, oh, is this um, one of the city beautification movements? Probably. Could be. Um trying to tidy up because they couldn't they couldn't of course rebuild in one go so they just cleared away um i think this was one of the beautification movements yeah that they actually cleared away a lot of the the buildings that were abandoned because they were destroyed during the war and yeah they left it at that so actually it was nice in a way because there was a clean slate for the new buildings to um to what do you call this to rise again but on the other hand you took away the the things that you could have documented but the thing is documentation wasn't a big thing before so we didn't realize that we had to document things um in detail before so we did document in all fairness we did document but we didn't document everything because we didn't think it would be that important so um in that case i think yeah you cleaned everything and yeah, no more documentation because everything is gone. <laughs> but yeah, I, I still think it was one of those beautification and clean up movements during that time. Actually, I think Dr. Aimelaya had a theory about that. He mm -hmm. said some time ago that in terms of it was purposely cleared by the army because they wanted to have a junkyard para to tambakan ng mga kalat. So they cleared. So even the Puerta Santa Lucia, which was perfectly intact after the war, was purposely demolished so that makadaan yung mga truck. Tama po oh, ba? so that was ano. But I think parts of Anoha, it was after the war, but I think during the war, parts of it was also um, like parts of the gate. There's this photograph of, of one of the gates of Intramuros with a, a, a tank inside, no? Um, Fit inside that gate, medyo masikip siya, hindi siya makadaan. And you're like, okay, this is, um, that was uh, a little after World War II, but I think it was still World, World War II that time. But I didn't know about, I didn't know about that um, idea to have it as a junkyard or as um, a place to store scrap metal. That's news to me. Thank you for that. Uh, we have a question from Renz, uh, from Zoom. Renz Irvin de la Torre, this is a very poetic question, so a very poetic question, and I hope that you don't mind. Ma'am, what is Filipino architecture to you, based on your experiences? Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. This is a very, um, wow, this is a very motherhood statement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is a very Miss Universe question. What is this? Philippine right. architecture. Philippine architecture is basically the architecture that Filipinos produced. That's it in a nutshell. It's it um it's basically that. It's something that Filipinos produce. And if you're looking for something more, if you're looking for it to visibly reflect culture, of course it has to match the use, it has to match its users, it has to match um that which it was built for. So I think um, a lot of modern architecture during the 60s and 70s, although they look modern, still embody a lot of these um, principles of, of uh, this character of Filipino architecture. But you have to delve deep, uh, deeper. You have to look at the theory. You have to see past the concrete, the glass. And you will realize that these are still Filipino structures. So you don't have to have, um, you don't have to have capis. You don't have to have um, all of those uh, uh, barandillas and steep roofs and all of these elements of um, a Spanish colonial um, bahina bahina pato, for example, for you to be um, considered Filipino architecture. Likewise, you don't need to build a bahay kubo to be Filipino. You can build it, yes, it's Filipino because it was built by you, but my question is, is it still relevant right now? Is it still relevant for you, for the society that you are living in? Because if it is, if it is, if it's relevant to the Filipino people, it was built for the Filipino people, then yes, it is Filipino architecture. So I don't know if that was poetic enough for you. <laughs> I hope that answered that. 
<laughs> we hope so. Uh, we have because my, my focus is more really um, modern architecture and um, I did a study on Luxin and I was saying how Luxin's architecture is actually Filipino architecture because this was something as a student in the 90s, uh, this was something I was struggling with is Luxin's architecture Filipino because people were saying that it was, but I couldn't see it from my perspective as an undergraduate student. So it took um, grad school for me to realize, years of grad school for me to really see and prove to myself that yes, it is Filipino architecture and it embodies Filipino architecture. So it takes a bit of work, but it's there. Yeah, and it's an evolution, no? it's consistently within the time. Yes, it has to change because we change, diba? No, the Filipino yeah. the Filipino people changes. So we cannot expect it to be the same. So for the viewers, yes, and my son is saying hello. Okay, uh, we're gonna finish this and we'll go back to you. Hi sir, that's me. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, sorry for that cameo. I told you this was gonna happen, so <laughs> it's okay. Our uh, next question is from Alni Kaiser Hayudini. Hello, architect Karin. Thank you very much for informative talk. May I ask if you have if your CMP study for Intramuros factored in the proposed future developments in Intramuros, such as, such as the uh, proposed Intramuros, you know, the bridge? Oh, okay. So we were working on this and. Um, yes, we kind of mentioned that, um, but we just stuck to, oh, that's very, wow, this is very sensitive. Thank you, Almi, for this question. I don't know whether to thank you for this, actually. It's a very sensitive question, but yes, we did factor it in. It was one of the issues and challenges that we listed down, and um, we recognized that building the bridge could compromise um the core zone, the core and buffer zone of the uh, the Church of San Agustin. So that was stated there. Thank you so much for that. This one is from, um, let me see. Our next question is, uh, why does the Manila Cathedral or the Plaza de Roma appear as focal points in the expansion and development of uh, the Moors through time? So, uh, any comments? Very good observation. Actually, that's okay. My cat also wants to answer. <laughs> no, but honestly, this is this is um, this is the beauty of the Leyes de las Indias, no? That the focal point is not a building because if you look at previous models, no, the European models, the center of the city would always be your Gothic church, your palace, no? all of these big structures, but in uh, the laws of the Indies, the center always of your city is an open space. So it's interesting why they designated an open space as the center of, of the cities. And you will find this in if, if you read through um, the laws of the Indies law. It's, it's really the plaza as the open space, and it's a space for congregation, it's a space for meeting, it's a space for collaboration. And it says that um, surrounding all uh, the plaza has to be the primary buildings for uh, the government, okay? The most important buildings in, uh, in the settlement. So in this case, it was the church because uh, of course, Spanish brought over religion, uh, made us Catholics. So the church was of prime importance, of course. So you have the Manila Cathedral there. And on either side, of course, you have um, the seats of government. Okay, so you have that's that's always the assemblage, and you will see this throughout uh, Spanish colonial cities. Of course, if if it is depicted in a postcard in a photograph, you would want to depict the most beautiful parts of the city, and in a Spanish colonial city, it would always contain the plaza because the plaza always had the prime building surrounding it, so you had the best view ever. So diba, even if in the provinces, there is this, um, there is this parang, uh, bragging factor. If your house in the province is actually near the plaza, so your your family is one of the important families of the district. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the reason why. Of course, you want to show the beautiful things 
in in your postcards in your in your drawings and that's why it's always featured yeah there and there are a lot of plazas in it for in fact uh, sure. in your in your research were you able to see that uh, when intramuros started uh, there were in fact two major plazas the, the plaza mayor is one the plaza roma mm -hmm. is one but there's another one in port santiago where the where the original palace of the governor was yes kaya lang nawawala na sila kaya nga ano kaya nga plaza roma is important because it's still alive and um there's another little plaza i forget where it is i think it's behind manila cathedral another small plaza and i think um the use of that has it's it's still in the same spot though i'm not sure but yeah but Plaza Roma is one of the only consistent plazas that have stayed over time. So we really have to, even if there's nothing there, you have to protect that spot because it's very important. It's an integral part of Intramuros. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, earlier in your presentation, you uh, uh, presented a statement of significance mm -hmm. uh, proposed by the CMP of Intramuros. Now, the statement of significance, as you have presented, is Intramuros as a resilient community, as a resilient settlement. Now, uh, how does the, uh, basing on that, how is the significance of Intramuros different from other cultural sites which are equally resilient? Good question, no? Um, this actually gives us a bit of uh, leeway because um, we are saying actually that Intramuros is a survivor. No? Intramuros is a survivor because there are these aspects which we defined also that have survived throughout time. And that's a lot of history to go through. No? We, were, we were looking at the periods of, of architecture. No? We have seven periods. And I think the second period, um, Manila as a primate uh, Spanish city, encompassed, I think, almost 300 years because that is the entire development of Intramuros, um, the, the shape and, and composition of which we know it today. Okay, So we're saying um, the resiliency of Intramuros is that it is there, it will remain here, and it will remain here as long as we support the things that keeps it alive. So it's it's like a fire, no? So you have to keep it alive. It's it's and we know we know naman that fires can die. That's why it's important to keep this resiliency alive. And a large part of this, I think, is the people. Because if it if Intramuros loses its value with the people who value it, it loses its significance. It's not significant anymore. It's significant now because we recognize it as significant. We we allotted um, time and effort to be able to make a CMP, a study of it, and we said that its value is it's in, in its resiliency and how it's kind of able to reinvent itself. Um, it slightly sticks to its original purpose, but each time it's it comes out a bit better, a bit different maybe a bit better, some would say maybe not better, but always better, always looking forward. And that's how I see it today with, with a lot of the activities that are going on in Intramuros, a lot of the, it's managed to get a lot of young people interested in Intramuros again. And I think that's fabulous because these are the people who will be taking care of Intramuros in the years to come. So courting that, is actually working towards the resiliency, making these people aware what are the values associated with Intramuros. So in Intramuros, it's a bit different because it's, um, what do you call this? Every structure actually, it's multifaceted. But the thing with Intramuros, there are so many stakeholders. There's the city of Manila, there's the national government, <laughs> there's the people of Manila, there's, there's even if you're not from Manila, you feel involved in Intramuros because it's part of your heritage as a Filipino. So you have you're 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 actually um, in in vulgar parlance, mananagut ka sa You're answerable to all of those people if if something happens to Intramuros. So that's that's what you have to understand that Intramuros is resilient, but also understand why is it resilient? What makes it resilient? And part of that is society, the people, the four pillars, like I discussed a while ago. And uh, can we say that in, 
part of the identity of Winter Moors is actually being destroyed all the time, no? Being destroyed. Oh, it's being destroyed all the time. Well, it was it was technically it was destroyed. Na sobrang destroyed. Oh, nga, it was super destroyed. It was destroyed by fires. It was destroyed by earthquakes. And every time it reinvents itself, no? When it was destroyed by fires, they said, okay, no more building in wood. Everybody builds in stone. And then the earthquakes came and said, wait, okay, hindi pala pwede all stone. Let's make wood and stone. <laughs> so, makikita mo, no? It's really part of that narrative of, of constant redevelopment of not only of, of Intramuros, but of Filipino architecture. Because Intramuro set the style. Kayo yung ano eh, kayo yung um, style maker. Oh, my, my cat agrees. Intramuros is the style maker. Kayo yung sinusundan ng lahat ng buong Pilipinas. So it's like, oh, what's happening in Intramuros? We should do that also in our town. So we can be, what do you call this? We can be up to date. There's that thing eh, kasi even now in, 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 in our... Um, towns, may mga ganyang inggitan, di ba? You see, oh, they have that. We have we have to have that too. And, yeah, Metro Manila is, is the conglomeration of Metro Manila is what uh, the people in the provinces kind of not look up to, okay? I might get into trouble for saying that. But, yeah, it's it's a lot of modernism. A lot of development is happening. And that uh, develop, those developments are something that people would like to echo in other places. Uh, so, it almost is always uh, destroyed and reconstructed after that. But I think the the difference right now is that unlike in previous centuries, reconstruction was always organic, no, always organic. But this time, in this modern time, whenever reconstruct, it, there's always this conscious effort to reconstruct something which is already gone. Na na yun lang to. Before there was no such consciousness, right? I agree. Kasi di ba when when uh, when when your house fell down that day, you just build it up. I, I don't care whatever guidelines are there. But but now we are more connected. We're more, it's not only the Philippines. Eh? We're, we're cognizant of all these international conservation standards that we have to adhere to. So yeah, it's it's kind of harder now. It's I agree with you. It was more organic before. It was more rooted in the people, what they wanted to happen, how they wanted to change their built environment. Now it's, um, will I conform to these guidelines? <laughs> will I, am I, am I actually um, in breach or am I conforming? So there's that dilemma. Where, where should I, um, what should I do in relation to new developments? Yeah, that's interesting you know, because they've always added something new after destruction. Like for example, the Santo Domingo Church, they added Gothic. Yeah, diba? And, oh, diba? And nung mauso yung Gothic, nagsulputan na lahat ng Gothic. Um, we were we were off topic, but we were looking at some churches in Leyte and suddenly you would see this very Romanesque church, pero yung tower niya Gothic. <laughs> like, oy, nainggit. <laughs> oy, they saw something in, in yeah, that's, that's, that's what I'm saying about um, the influence of Manila. Intramuros in particular, because that's what people look up to. And they bring back elements of them because people always go to Manila. They bring back elements of them in the province. So your influ Manila in itself influences also the rest of the Philippines. So yeah, but I wish no, I wish it were more simple, it were more organic. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, building regulations in Intramuros started in the uh, American era. So mm -hmm. it was started by Commonwealth Act number 171, yes, right? CA. Mm -hmm. 171. Now, uh, were you able to discover in your research how CA 171 was actually reflected in the urban, in the physical setting? How was it carried out? Was it carried out uh, faithfully? And if it was, can you cite buildings which conformed to CA 171 during the American era? Actually, there's this very good study, you know, by um, Miss Santiago. I think it was published by the UP, UP SERP, you know, School of Urban and Reg Regional Planning. And she was actually part of the early years of Intramuros administration. And it was, uh, what do you call this? It was part of her research. Her data actually came from her actual experience working with Intramuros. And she was saying that it was... Um, it was so difficult to do. It was so difficult because 
all these CAs, um, the Commonwealth Act, the letter of the LOIs, sometimes had conflicting descriptions. And I highlighted those in one of my readings. Um, one says it has to conform um, to Spanish colonial character. And then another one said it has to conform to Spanish, uh, Spanish character lang yung una. Tapos yung pangalawa, Spanish colonial character of the 16th to 19th centuries. So mas specific na. Tapos, the next one, modern constructions but with Spanish colonial style. So parang, what do we mean by this? It is not defined. So if it is not defined, how can you expect, kung, kung ako nga arkitekto ako, I cannot understand what is being said. How can the, how can the normal tao interpret that into something buildable. So a lot of people were just interpreting it the way they wanted to, which is like, oh, so guess, med- medyo Spanish, um, so ang image nila medyo bahay na bato, so that's what they did. But it was very open to interpretation, the way that it was worded. It's a good thing and a bad thing um, because you could say that, oh, my my mass my form and massing is Spanish colonial, but my interpretation is modern. So you could say that that is still I think within the guidelines, kind of arguable within, kind of arguable. But um, it's how you interpret things, kasi. And if how it is stated, and there are sometimes conflicting um, statements, as I said, because we did a study of all the legal documents pertaining to intramuros. So starting with the CA, LOIs until they became RAs and uh, presidential decrees. And I was like, okay, ano ba talaga? <laughs> Parang, okay, different people wrote this because maybe it was it was conflicting. Sometimes they were the same. Sometimes they supported one another. But sometimes something would come out like, wait, where did that come from? So, diba? I mean, I'm sure you've seen it, Rancho. And, and, you're, you're kind of thrown for a loop. How do I interpret this? So yeah, that's that's the challenge. So I think during that time when when the Commonwealth Act came, it 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 was just that. Um, some I think it was a, 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 for, a form of preservation because people um, people were looking for change. So they were looking at the new buildings that Americans were building. They were looking at modernization. They were looking at all these big public buildings and they were saying that, oh, this is the path to progress. Should we raise intramuros and build it like this? Because this is this is the this is the future. But um, the Commonwealth Acts just say that intramuros is important because it is part of our Spanish colonial past. And and the people who recognize that, Spanish colonial. So that's that's the image. Na tumatak sa kanila that that stayed with them that it had to be that it was part of our past and it had to the buildings there had to had had to have Spanish colonial character so it was basically that but the term Spanish colonial character or Spanish era architecture was never defined no not in any document at all yes it was never defined I would I would like a, a consensus because one can define it. Anyone yeah. can define it, but it has to be agreed upon that this is our definition as as a body, as the Filipinos, that this is what Spanish colonial architecture is. This, I mean, in the context of how Intramuros, um, how it is mentioned in uh, the rebuilding or, or, or the new buildings in Intramuros. And I think the only uh, specifications that we have are the massing, no? the height, Oh, that. And sometimes, medyo, there are areas in Intramuros that strictly adhere to that massing. No, you can see really the lines. Wow, iba ibang buildings may pantay pantay yung um ant- mga bulada nila. Tapos makikita mo sa ibang blocks, medyo tumataas na nag cheat na sila. <laughs> Tarang oi, wait lang. But but that's okay. But at least they were cognizant of the fact that there was something actually to conform to. Because it's 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 hard. It needs to be interpreted more. Uh, our next question is from Zoom. So, if you were given the opportunity to lead a reconstruction project in Intramuros, uh, what would the first 
thing that you want to focus on? What uh, what do you want to reconstruct first and why? Bakit mga Miss Universe ang mga question? What would be reconstructed? It's hard to say what would be reconstructed kasi mamaya may building na doon. How can you reconstruct if there's already a building? So, yes, to reconstruct a building, uh-huh. one building, what would it be? Oh my gosh! <laughs> one building that would be reconstructed. Now, I'm thinking about the um, the original government buildings of Intramuros, no? Um, so, the Palacio del Gobernador, of course, it's it's where IA is now. And, of course, um, the, the building across from it was already restored. What is left? It's the Intendencia. <laughs> and that would be interesting to see. And, of course, I, I um, that would be interesting to see it rebuilt to its former glory because it's part of that whole ensemble. No, it's part it's part of that whole dialogue um that brings us to that uh that part, that that part of time, that part of our heritage. So that could be interesting. Also an, uh, other buildings. I I really can't think about anything. Um one thing that popped into my head when you said that any any anything I would like to see in Intramuros again, I would like the Magnolia ice cream house to come back to Intramuros. I had many fond memories of that. So I want to see that back, but it's gone. It used to be in front of Manila Cathedral. Anyway, so that's no that's part of that was part of my childhood. So um yeah. Actually yeah that was something. But it's 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 yeah it's more of a space rather than an actual place. So, for place, oh God, it's so tricky. I, I, I really, I really don't know. <laughs> That's a hard question. Good job. If, uh, do you think there's a part of Intramuros that can be subjected again to another round of nomination for World Heritage Site? Oh, and if wow. it is, what do you think? Do you think the grid, maybe the fortification? Actually, we were talking about that, no? We were talking about that because we were looking at, um, you know, when you're doing the CMP, you go off on different tangents because when you do research, no, you start researching this and then suddenly you're you're plunged into uh, a black hole and then it, it multiplies. So this particular thing, we were looking at, um, we were validating intramuros um, as part of the loss of the Indies, okay. So we were we even dated the loss of the Indies because, of course, it's a collection, no? And we were saying that oh, the last one um, was dated. I forget the date, but it was before Intramuros. Um, I think was officially established. So we we said that oh, maybe the the learnings that came from Mexico were already implemented here, even if it wasn't implicitly stated that this was the loss of the Indies, but. All of the let, meron din silang letters, letters from from the king, letters of instruction also, no, that it should be like this, the layout should be like that. So that formed the backbone of that, and we were trying to validate that, and we we were seeing what other um, Spanish colonial uh, fortified cities were there in the whole world, and we came across this study of Dr. Shioda from the University of Shiga, and it said there there were only I don't know, no, I, I I haven't validated this, but there were only 14 fortified cities, Spanish colonial cities. And um Intramuros apparently is number eleven. I think it's in, in it's one of his articles, and that Intramuros is number eleven, and that some of the the other cities don't even have grid. They don't even follow the grid pattern. So we still have the grid pattern. And we still have the walls. And I think the walls are super, super important. Because um, I think there's not much study uh, as of of as of now, no? Not much study has been done um, as to the walls of Intramuros, really, and how it links to that Spanish colonial heritage. Because the, the, the fortifications actually are architecture, Right, they're 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 built heritage. They're part of our architecture, and there was a particular technology that was incorporated in those walls. That is European technology, no? And it is, and our and our walls and the walls of Intramuros 
is a living testament to that. So it should be studied. Anong technology ba talaga ang pumasok? Kasi it was built over time, no? There are many, there were many times na it was nasira din siya, it was rebuilt again. And those different iterations, you can see the development of, of this sort of vocabulary of fortifications. So there's an actual group, I think, I forgot what it was called, but there's there's this, I don't know if it's a yearly thing, but it's a conference on fortifications. Ecofort? Um, yes, Ecofort. Thank you, thank you. An Ecofort. And no, we, we've, I think we've submitted, there was um, a very good paper submitted to that. I, I don't know if it was um, by Santiago or someone, but someone submitted to that regarding Intramuros. And there was another that was um, comparing Intramuros and Jaipur, India. I think there was another, not by a Filipino. But it was interesting to see that because I think we kind of take the the, the walls for granted. <laughs> and because they're there, they're, they're surrounding us, but they're actually very important. And they are, if you're looking at integrity and authenticity, they are what tick the boxes for, for a World Heritage Site. But yeah, you have to be very careful. You have to yeah, prove that um, you have to study it more to be able to nominate it. But I would like to see that. Go, go IA. <laughs> I passed the ball, no? go IA. It's even interesting to note that Intermuros existed earlier than the loss of the Indies. Yeah, so, but, um, yeah. Not exactly, um, because the loss of the Indies, no, it wasn't really called the loss of the Indies per se. Um, it was just a series of instructions from the king who I think wanted to dabble in urban planning. So he said, he kept writing the people in Mexico like, oh, do this, do that. Uh, don't do this, do that um, with regards to their planning. So um, they were, even if it wasn't called the loss of the Indies, it didn't have the title loss of the Indies. It was already a specific letter of instruction from the king on how to lay cities out. So... And it was also because of all the learnings of, of, because we were one of the last to be colonized, no, by the Spanish, mm -hmm. um, after South America. So all the learnings from South America, even if it wasn't written down, came to us by default. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful presentation. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. Right. Mm -hmm. We actually have a lot more questions, but we are running out of time. Wow. Okay. So for those who are interested in the topic and would like to ask our speaker, feel free to uh, send an email to our speaker, uh, cpsantillan uh, cp at ust.edu.ph. This is uh, the correct email, no? So, yes, it is. It is santillan at ust.edu.ph. For those who would like to ask any questions, or maybe you want, would like to ask for a copy of the PowerPoint. So you can go directly to our speaker. No need to ask your questions uh, to us. You can go to our speaker. Now, uh, before I end this webinar, I'd like to promote our social media channels. The Intramuros Administration is available in Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. So make sure to subscribe and like us to get updates on future webinars, future uh, Intramuros Learning Session episodes. So we are in Facebook, Twitter, and, and Instagram, and importantly also YouTube, because if you missed this episode or you came in late, you can go to YouTube later because we're going to upload this YouTube, uh, we're going to upload this uh, session in our YouTube channel. So just key in Intramuros Administration in our, uh, in, in YouTube, uh, search for us and then you can look for our videos or you can go to this link bit.ly slash IAILS. IAILS is all caps. So bit.ly slash IAILS. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button. And I also like to promote our channel at the Google Arts and Culture. So we are also available in Google Arts and Culture. Just key in Intramuros Administration. In Google Arts and Culture, uh, you can view our museum collection. So many of our artifacts have already been digitized. And if you missed going to our museums, 
and unfortunately cannot come because of the quarantine, you can visit us in our Google Arts and, Cult Google Arts and Culture page. So just key in Tramuas Administration. And finally, I'd like to announce that the Intramuros District of Manila, so our walled city, our beloved Ciudad Morada, has been nominated for this year's Asia's Leading Tourist Attraction. So congratulations, we have been nominated this year for Asia's Leading Tourist Attraction. Uh, just that trivia, we've actually won the title in 2016. So this is not our first. Actually, we are, we are being nominated every year since 2012. In 2016, we won. And hopefully, this year, we also win. So this is very important to us. So 11 sites in Asia have been nominated. And Intramuros is one. So what are these uh, sites? So what are uh, the Intramuros other... Uh, uh, what is the competition of uh, Intramuro? So we have Angkor Wat in Cambodia, we have Borobudur in Indonesia, we have the Great Wall of China, Halong Bay in Vietnam, the Taj Mahal of India, uh, the Terracotta Warriors of China, the Forbidden City of China, the Tokyo Imperial Palace in Japan, Victoria Peak in Hong Kong, and of course, we have Intramuros Manila. So we hope that we win again. So uh, this year we hope that we win. So how can you help us? Uh, you can go to the website world tra world travels world travel awards.com so that's www.worldtravelawards.com slash vote and click register you need to create an account in order for you to vote so you need to verify your account first and then look for asia's leading tourist attraction and then vote for the philippines uh, for intramuros so what does this uh, mean for us why is this important for us because apart from the potential of having new visitors once travel is allowed under the new normal, this is uh, this will boost the morale and recognition of every tour guide, every cochero, every pedicab driver and guide, museum, restaurant, hotel, and every hardworking tourism st stakeholders and thanking them for their contribution in making our destination world class. So this would mean a lot for everyone, for all of the stakeholders here in Tramuros and for all of us, because Intramuros is for all Filipino. And I'd also like to announce, lastly, that aside from the Asia's leading a tourist attraction nomination, the Philippines have also been nominated in four other major categories. So we have been nominated as well. So the Department of Tourism have been, been nominated for Asia's leading tourist board. We have been nominated for Asia's leading dive destination, Asia's leading beach destination, and Asia's leading wedding destination. So Cebu has been nominated, Cebu Philippines has been nominated as Asia's leading wedding destination for this year. So support, help us support uh, our nomination. So vote, vote for the Philippines. And thank you so much for your support. <clears throat> now, before uh, we end this, uh, I would like to call on uh, Architect Santillan. Would you like to have any final words before we end? Oh, I, I just like to thank you. Thank you, Rancho, and thank you to the rest of Intermodos administration for inviting me today. That was fun, despite all the interruptions with the cats and dogs and children. Um, <laughs> I, I hope um, this this Intermodos learning sessions, these learning sessions of yours continues because they're very entertaining, very fun, and very accessible to a lot of people. So thank you for making me, inviting me to be a part of this. That's it. Thank you. Happy weekend, everyone. Thank you, dear speaker, and thank you to everyone who viewed this episode today. So that's it for today. Until next time, but for now, bye-bye.